I want to begin by saying that I read that the reason you got involved in art is because it was one of the few things you could do better than your sister. So um, is sibling rivalry what sparks your whole career? Uh, well, my sister, I have only one sibling, but my sister uh, could always do everything better. She was three years older, so she could jump higher and count further, uh, speak better. But finally, uh, when my parents saw me drawing one day, uh, they kind of patted me on the back that I, I finally had my own place in the family. And uh, you know, I think that everybody you become involved in areas in life for very simple reasons such as that. And speaking of family, you've just become a father for the eighth time in August. You have, a, you have, a, you have three grandchildren. Mm -hmm. And I am interested because so many of your, um, so many of your pieces are very playful and, and toy-like and, and childlike. And I was wondering, what do children teach you or why are so many of your pieces really kind of very glossy and play-like? Uh, everything that I've been able to pick up from the activity of uh, creating uh, work uh, really leads me to the act of acceptance and of uh, first accepting the self and then once you accept yourself you want to kind of expand your parameters and you go outward and uh, children really don't make judgments I mean they're open to everything they're open to the sky because it's blue they're open to the the color pink because it's pink. And, I mean, they're just open to everything. And so I'm attracted to those uh, type of images to always uh, communicate acceptance and openness. And so many of the images that we are bombarded with today aren't really images from art or drawings or sculptures. Does that, so, I mean, you can look at the Zeitgeist logo, for example. What, what influences you or how are you influenced by this accelerating technology of images that we're seeing all the time? You know, I, I was admiring all day the Zeitgeist logo. It's, uh, it's beautiful uh, in its color. But, you know, it's wonderful. Uh, through technology, there's so many more connections that, uh, that we can make to things. And the power of art is uh, connections, just consciousness itself. But uh, the more connections that you make, the more three-dimensional something becomes and the more it imitates life. Mm -hmm. And art always wants to somehow get up on top of uh, and that it can create life. It can be an artificial life form. You always think, oh, this time you can do it. But of course, it always fails. But uh, technology uh, and all gives just more connections to actually make art much more powerful. But you're the kind of, you, you put a Hoover vacuum cleaner inside a cube, you've suspended a basketball in, some of, uh, in, in liquid, I guess, in some of your earlier work. So are we gonna pass to Android phones next or uh, will you, what will you celebrate from the current technology? Uh, well, you know, technology, I, I, it's important to use it as a tool. And I think that uh, young artists, are, or if people try to grab a hold of something, uh, technology that's, uh, new and they think, oh, if I just show this, uh, my work will be new. But uh, art really comes from a very uh, profound place of just kind of following your interests and focusing on those interests. And it, it takes you to an archetypal type of uh, vocabulary. Uh, my work actually, as we look at and we see a lot of external images, ready-made objects, uh, these are things, again, to communicate this act of uh, acceptance and embracing uh, the environment around you, that everything's here. I've actually have, uh, started to go and become much more involved uh, with the work of Picasso and have found that uh, kind of the internal type landscape that he was dealing with is finding that very, very objective. And because uh, um, again, it deals with acceptance. So you're going more inward, in other words. Uh, but through this inward process, it automatically takes you uh, outward, uh, <laughs> outward again. You know, um, you're famous for having an amazing factory for art in New York, and you don't touch any of the work that you create yourself. And you have a, instead you have an army of assistants, and some of them paint as small as a little postcard with numbered uh, paint. The, the paint has different numbers, and then they apply it. Can you talk about 
uh, your process, because I know you're famous for being just fanatic and throwing stuff away after it's been worked on for a couple of years if you don't think the paint dried right or something. But talk about your process and why you don't touch your own work. Um, you know, it, it's not that I can't. I mean... Uh, oh, well, we know that. But, uh, <laughs> Well, no, but when I say that, I mean, you know, today, if I feel like I have to, and, and of course, I'm touching everything. And uh, it's uh, just as, uh, you know, if you, an artist picks up a brush and, you know, you're telling your fingertips, okay, I want to hold this brush and just pull it this way. In working with other people, you're just also, uh, you're informing them how, what you're looking for, and you're articulating and producing something that uh, the marks that they make are also articulations through an extension from... Uh, so what is the thing that you most, that you worked on the longest that in the end you just destroyed? Uh, you know, there's been very few things. I mean, some paintings that maybe the, the ground wasn't the best ground or that it uh, got damaged. But uh, when, usually it takes a lot of time to make something and there's an economic expense to it. So I really think about things beforehand and I uh, pre-edit my uh, work a lot. But I stopped working with my hands. Uh, one time on a summer job, I kind of damaged my hand working in a machine shop. Mm -hmm. And I was always fearful, maybe I'll get arthritis in that hand. And I started to follow Duchampian kind of ideas. Uh, so I think that kind of took me this uh, path of, oh, just working with the ready-made. But then philosophically, I, I didn't want to alter anything. I, I didn't want to have my own uh, involvement uh, in kind of making any changes to things. Well you, well, you didn't want to alter them philosophically. What do you mean by that? Uh, that they were perfect. Uh, this sense of uh, acceptance. And, uh, you know, if you look at acceptance and first accepting yourself and then having the com uh, confidence to go outward, what it would lead you to is the acceptance of others. And uh, to just uh, this kind of state of, of complete removal of anxiety of just having total acceptance. And I thought that's kind of the closest thing to kind of walking out of Plato's cave. Well, you know, it's interesting because you exhibited, for example, some of your hearts and some of your pieces in Versailles, and that was considered scandalous when it was done. So. I, I, I think from listening to you, you're talking about acceptance and you're talking about universal imagery, et cetera. So you're just trying to bring people together in, in spaces that you wouldn't ordinarily consider them to be. Uh, <clears throat> Maureen, what I've always really enjoyed about art uh, is that it's, it's about uh, information and uh, making connections to things, but it's about uh, taking that information and bringing it through the senses. So it's very much also about the way you feel. And it's about in heightened situations, in heightened feeling. And uh, so that's a, you know, a, a, a very important uh, part of what art is and differentiates it from other forms of kind of collection of information. Because it also, you, you know, you want it to affect biology. You want it to uh, affect who we are as humans and to be able you know, to hopefully affect our genes of what it means to be human and uh, what possibilities there are for feeling of intensity, excitement. We also have something called the art market, which goes up and down. Um, and I'd like to read you a quote um, that I, I came across the other day that I thought was quite interesting from Klaus Biesenbach, the uh, curator at MoMA, and he said, Art is not the art market. Art history is not the history of the art market. Art is about ideas and civilization, and yet too often it's marginalized by the market in America. And I know that you were a commodities trader for four years on Wall Street, and I was wondering what that experience taught you about the art market. Uh, that it's much more moral than uh, kind of <laughs> the trading uh, uh, market. But I did that only to support myself, that I would be able to have enough income to make the artworks that I wanted to make. Mm -hmm. So I, I was a trader for about uh, uh, four years. But people do focus on uh, the art market. I always just wanted to participate. Mm -hmm. uh, I grew up uh, admiring different artists, Dali or Warhol, and uh, I always just wanted to uh, take part in the dialogue. And I think like in any area, you. When you want to participate, eventually somebody throws you the ball. 
and uh, you know I, I wanted to uh, to be involved. So um, I think a market is just possibly some way of showing whether society finds any value in what you're doing, what you're not doing. Uh, but it's also very, very vast. The art market is much vaster than it possibly could be as far as... Uh, but you have, um, with your factory, and how many assistants do you have working for you? 140. 140. So you have a, a lot to support then, so the market does become important to a certain extent, does it not? Uh, the reality of you know trying to be able to sustain that as far as right. a, a continuing kind of uh, endeavor of workforce it would be, but that's not the focus. I mean, I always believe, you know, if I do what uh, I would like to do and what I uh, do well, hopefully there's somebody there that will appreciate that. I'd like to talk to you about uh, some of your specific images. One of the ones, one of the ones you first became famous for was you did a uh, six foot long, I think, white porcelain statue of Michael Jackson and Bubbles the Chimp. Why did you make him white? Um, that was for my banality exhibition. And in the banality exhibition, I was trying to communicate to people that whatever your cultural history is, it's perfect. And that people would just accept their own uh, 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 cultural history. And I knew in doing that, I'd have to have kind of like spiritual figures there that people would feel uh, uh, at ease to go along with this uh, sense of acceptance. So. You know, Michael Jackson's really there in the same kind of configuration as the Pieta. And so uh, it's this triangular kind of Renaissance type of sculpture or uh, 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 taking place there. So, uh, and I, I was showing him as like a contemporary Christ figure. Well, since I'm the person that did five investigated pieces on him in pedophilia, that startles me a little bit. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, well, at the time that I did this, this was in 88. Mm -hmm. And so the type of adulation that people give to celebrity. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Michael was a performer, was an amazing performer. And Absolutely. the way, you know, <laughs> uses voice, do these different things, was very about, much about being alive and feeling in the moment <laughs> and sensation. And so when I made that work, uh, that's what it was about, this type of adulation and um, that people do, and, and placing him as a contemporary Christ-like figure the way people place celebrity. But at the same time, this work had to absorb also, you know, his downfall. And, uh, but artworks were also free of that, just like, uh, you know, Andy's Marilyn's free of that, or his Elvis is, is free of that. I'd like to also talk to you about one of your most famous pieces is your, your puppy, the beautiful one that was in front of the Bilbao, is, in, is it still in front of the Bilbao Museum? And that particular piece weighs 44 tons, isn't it? Doesn't it? Uh, it weighs a lot. And I, I think that I did hear that figure at one time. And 70,000 flowering plants and 25 tons of soil. I mean, you're thinking big. Right. Uh, yes, I spent a lot of time, Marine, in uh, in Europe, and I went to a lot of Baroque and Rococo churches, and I wanted to uh, create an artwork that would really reveal the dialogue, this type of uh, negotiation that takes place in the Baroque and the Rococo. Mm -hmm. uh, so you know, it's made out of live plants. So I think that the piece was very much about control that it takes to make a work like that but also giving up control, that uh, once it's planted and every decision's made where this plant goes against yeah. that plant, you walk away and it's just in the hands of nature. And you know, some plants are gonna shoot out 100 centimeters in this direction, another you know, will only go out 60 centimeters, but uh, will wanna dominate uh, across the surface. So you can just walk away from it and let nature take its course? That's right. Now, it reminds me also of a bumper sticker I saw uh, last week in Berkeley in this old broken down car that said, insatiability is not sustainable. <laughs> this is not sustainability. <laughs> so when you get something on that scale, do you ever think in those terms at all, or do you just let your imagination go wild? Uh, one of the beautiful things about art is that, you know, it deals with the impractical. And, uh, so, you know, if something presents itself and it has enough uh, reason to come into being, you try to do that. Uh, but there, there's some things that, uh, you know, you can think about that 
you know, do not come into being. Now tell us a little bit about the, the, the really big project that you aspire to do, which is to suspend a 1943 locomotive from a 160-foot crane on the High Line of New York. And um, how's, how's that coming? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, it's running into some opposition. And, uh, <laughs> uh, it, it's running into opposition in that, you know, I had the idea uh, maybe about uh, a decade ago, mm -hmm. and I've, uh, you know, uh, created the models, and we went into engineering phases, and originally we thought we could build it for 25 million, and then when uh, people became interested, and we'd get a little deeper into the engineering, because that also costs a lot, we found out it costs a little more, and more recently, it was as high as up to 50 million. And so uh, that's putting it on hold a little bit uh, at the present moment, but what I really want to do is uh, uh, strip it down. And I really like to have this uh, piece come into the world, and the only way to do that is to try to be able to have it accomplish everything that I want, but I have to bring it in uh, to be less expensive. Uh, but it, can I say what it would do, the train? Sure. Uh, the train would function really the way maybe a square does in Europe or a different architectural piece would do as a rallying point for people. And it would perform uh, three times a day. You know, it could perform once a day, or but three times a day I envisioned it. And uh, when it would perform, it would do everything that a real train would do. And a real train, it takes eight hours to build up enough steam and power to pull out of a train station. This would condense that time to 30 minutes. So if you're sitting underneath it, uh, you would maybe start to see a little steam leaking or lights uh, flickering uh, uh, from the heat of the, uh, uh, the firebox. But eventually, it'll start to move. And then just as we uh, breathe, that's the only thing that a train does. The only noise that a train really makes, if you take it off its tracks, is it's breathing. <sighs> And it would start just from that first turn of the firing of the pistons until it's going full speed. Uh, and in this case, it would be 80 miles an hour. It would uh, hit this plateau, woo, 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 woo. And then it would take on the same kind of bell curve going up to that plateau. It'll slow down at the same speed until that last. And, uh, and each time it puffs, it's like the, in the Times Square, the, 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 the guy who used to blow the, kind of the smoke rings, it's a perfect little puff of steam that comes out. Uh, and it, it was just to that people get a, a sense of power, but at the same time it keeps you in uh, contact with mortality. And you know, uh, that isn't the, uh, the most technological thing today, but it still connects you with this type of power. So it does give you some sense of mortality, sense of family unity, uh, community. Uh, and you, if this comes into being, you will have created a great landmark for the city of New York, forever. Or wherever it would go. <laughs> wherever yeah. it would yeah. go. Yeah. Thank you so much for ha uh, joining us. We very much enjoyed it. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Thank you.